All right, welcome everybody. Thank you, those of you that are here with us at the Brattleboro Museum, and thank you, those of you who are with us from your homes or wherever you are through HowlRound. Thank you to HowlRound for um, including us in your amazing platform. We are celebrating Sandglass's 40th anniversary. This is our 11th Puppets in the Green Mountains Festival. Oh, come on. Um, and it's just been such a thrill. It's been such a thrill to have the guest artists here, to have these conversations that partner the shows. So our audiences are experiencing these performances from all over the world, but also having a chance to really dig in deeper into the work and, and build uh, bridges between things that are happening here in this community as well. So I'm very excited about today. Um, just to announce a few things before we begin. For those of you that are in the room, if you haven't gotten your Santa Glass merch yet, <laughs> please do so at the next show. There's still tickets left for tonight's shows, uh, Body Concert and Dafa Theater at the Youth Theater and up at Hilltop. So you can see our, our ticket counter over there if you want to get your last minute tickets or also for tomorrow. Crystal Puppeteers here will be doing one final performance on Sunday at F five o'clock <laughs> at the um, in Putney behind the Putney Inn. It's part of Next Stage's bandwagon series. Um, so we hope you'll all come out and join us for the. It'll be the final show of the festival. And I just want to take a moment to thank our funders. I want to thank the Brattleboro Museum for letting us set up our panels in here and giving us such huggable things in the lobby. If you haven't hugged one of the pods yet, please do. They're very comfortable. Um, and I want to thank the Bay and Paul Foundation, the Brattleboro Food Co-op Roundup for Change program, which, which is community members rounding up to support their local puppet theater and other community organizations. The Clues Fund, the Price Chopper Gulag Foundation, the Thomas Thompson Trust, the Two West Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, Chroma Technologies, the Wyndham Foundation. And if you have taken a sand glass program for the festival, please look at the businesses that chose to advertise with us and support the festival. Go do business with them, thank them, um, and then you'll also see a little section of recognition of certain, um, a variety of programs and organizations in our community that are doing really amazing work in shifting resources and in really driving forward a healthier, more sustainable community. So one of those is sitting behind me on this panel, and you'll hear from them momentarily. Um, but I encourage you to look at the whole list in there and really look them up, do some research. And you're very lucky to get the privilege of hearing it straight from the source today. So thank you all so much for being here with us. And I'm going to turn it over to our facilitator, Laith, who comes to us through, well, for us, through the ROOT Social Justice Center Youth for Change program. Yep. And we're excited to continue working together. So Laith, over to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm still new to this, so I'm, I'm a bit nervous starting out. Um, I'm sure that I'm going to, to get the ball rolling. Um, this, each panel it has been based on like a, like a specific topic or group of topics um, that I'm going to read out. This, the last panel was based on um, like growing, I'm sorry, never mind, I'm just going to continue this on, I'm getting really nervous, sorry. <laughs> This panel is discussing how we shift resources and education and power within communities and how art and food, specifically, are doorways into important change and healing. And as the world is infected by the pandemic and climate change and economic inequities, how do arts and social initiatives work together and reach diverse populations and empower local voices? Now, I've had interviews with both groups um, that I am going to let introduce themselves in a second. Um, and I, me and Gabriel, who's sitting over there, creative producer, very new as well. Um, <laughs> how we've made a series of questions to ask you, and we're I'm going to ask you those questions 
then you'll have some time to ask some questions amongst yourselves. And then I'll give y'all some time to ask some questions. Um, so I am going to have you start putting on the spot. <laughs> Introduce yourselves. Would you like to start with an introduction as an individual or as a collective? As a, as a group? You can do either. Okay. Can you speak up? Please? Yeah, I'll definitely try to speak up. I apologize. I tend to speak softly. Um, how should I? So I'm Naomi, and I am one of the co-founders and co-directors of Susu Community Farm, along with Amber right here. Um, I'm the child of Lynn and Penelope. I'm the grandchild of, <laughs> of Ida and um, John Henry. I'm the great-grandchild of Jesse Cobbins and Cornelia Martin. And I am the Southern Times great-grandchild of Jenny Cobbins, who was born on a tobacco plantation in Virginia. And I consider myself a legacy farmer, um, not in the way that I've inherited anything as far as land or possessions go, but that I've inherited a legacy of connection to land and place. And so much of that connection is the heart of the work that we do at SUSU where it's really about creating space for people to come together and healing on land. So we heal not only ourselves and each other, but with the land itself. Um, my name is Amber Arnold, and I am also one of the co-founders and collaborative directors of Susu Community Farm. And I am very passionate about building community, about creating spaces for black and brown people to have reclaimed access to their imaginations and to their lineages and to their practices and for us to be intentionally building um, safe and thriving, nourishing, multiracial communities so that we can be building these um, cultures of liberation together and that's what we do at SUSU. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Fidelis Kialo. Um, from I'm the co-founder of the Crystal Puppeteers with my colleague. Um, I've been doing puppetry for the last 30 years in Kenya, born and raised in Kenya. Uh, we've been using puppets for education mostly um, to address most issues in the community, health, education, governance, anything that uh, really affects the community. And that's what has been our, our work ever since. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Jambo. Uh, that's a Swahili word for hello. My name is Crispy Mwakideo. Uh, as Fidel said, I'm a puppeteer, co-founder of Crystal Puppeteers. And I've known him since 95, I would say. And we've been working together uh, using theater as a tool for community development, as a tool for community change, and uh, improving the dialogue and basically um, helping the community to understand how they can live with one another in, uh, in peace and, and cohesion. Um, yeah, and that has been the, the journey so far. So we started in a little town in Kenya, in, at the coastal city, and now we're here somewhere in Brandleboro. <laughs> <laughs> the, the journey continues. <laughs> So then starting with questions, I'm going to ask you uh, a question that relates to both of you and both groups in some way. Um, Crystal, your show's premise surrounded the loss, it was a folk tale, it surrounded the loss of water in an area of land that became a desert, right? And caused like, the ecosystem, the society, the animals that are living there to slowly become desperate for food and water. And a very brave monkey decide to leave his home and try to find water, but he starves and dies in the process. But that's not the end, because he comes back to life later. Um. <laughs> Spoiler alert! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm bad at that. Um. And yeah, it has a much happier ending than just he starves and dies, oh no. <laughs> that's like the beginning. Um, but. And Naomi and Amber, how do you, how do you and your organization relate with land and resources and like the loss and like 
depleted access to land and resources in real life? And how do you think that this story specifically like, could pertain to reality? Yeah. <laughs> do you want us to go? Or I think you can, you can do it all in um, Maybe just to talk about um, the story, of which my colleague is also uh, talk about. Um, the story first is a folk, mm -hmm. but it has uh, so much relation in what is happening right now. Uh, as we are speaking right now in Kenya, we have 10 counties which are going under drought. There is so much drought happening right now as we are speaking. So that is a problem that has been happening. And we thought um, this is a story which has a relation to what is happening to our country for many years. And we thought addressing this issue will give a better picture of not seeing pictures of a very slim child taken, you know, and be shown this is drought. We wanted to put it in a different way. Talking about the drought, but not showing those silly pictures of kids who don't have food. So these people have seen that already so many times. It's yeah, just become like right. yes. and that is a weird way of showing an image of a drought. You know. So um, we've used this show to tell such kind of um, issues. Mm -hmm. Although of, of course there's another issue of aggression. I think Chris will be more about it in the show. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's that's also true in the story. Although we don't also like put it in your face that yeah, this is this is about migration. We we uh, we have tried to handle that aspect of that every human being desires or wants to have a better life. And when things really get tough, then there's that need to move to a better place where you can at least have a chance of survival. And we see that clearly in the story. Um, of course, politically, there are always <coughs> issues about whether that's, that's acceptable, who is a regular or irregular or illegal or legal migrant and all that kind of you know, uh, uh, labels that we have tagged. Um, but again, we leave it to the audience to, to, um, to deal with these issues because they are real, they are here with us, and, um, and we try to get that from the folktale and then incorporate some of these contemporary uh, uh, topics that are, are happening now uh, to tell this story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like one of the things like in relation to that that we explore a lot, you know, Atsusu is this idea of community and even through the Great Migration, like for one example, many black people migrated, to, or some black people migrated to Detroit because this was a place where there was thought to be you know, access to jobs and all of these things for people to thrive. And in Detroit, there was an area that was called um, Black Bottom, and a lot of indigenous people called it this then because of the fertile soils and when water would run down this way, it would create more of that soil. And this was also historically became a black neighborhood, which was right near Paradise Valley, which also became a, a historic place for black people where there was black banks and black real estate places and, and like a thriving black economy and a lot of that came out of the numbers game. So there was policy in the numbers game and the numbers game had um, originated for black people by black people and this was when the lottery was illegal. And the numbers game allowed black people to invest in businesses, invest in banks, to really build their community and to build this economy when the government and all of these spaces would not allow that to happen. And through the numbers game, like families were able to bet and to make money and could, you know, make like five dollars, which could feed, you know, a community, a group of people for, for a whole week. And eventually what happened was the government decided to build a freeway over Paradise Valley, which was this you know, really important and like thriving black area intentionally. And this pushed out over 100,000 um, black families from this area. And eventually the, the numbers men they were called who, who really kind of like were supporting this community and bringing these things to life ended up, the government ended up getting them to teach them about this lottery and the numbers game and that eventually kind of like led to that being 
capitalized on through um, the government. But I think if we think about being able to reclaim these stories and to be able to have access to storytelling and to understanding our culture and to understanding the ways that our communities have been caring for each other when they have been slated for extinction, the ways that our people have used you know, community determination and all of these practices that are rooted far beyond us you know, being in Turtle Island, but are rooted in our ancestry you know, in the diaspora and from where we came from in Africa where community was so central to the ways that we cared for each other. And so I think that hearing and watching the, the play and, and seeing this like powerful way of storytelling and how we remember and remind ourselves of what is happening and, and the way that migration and history and community all come together in this convolution helps us to remember how we can move forward and how we can continue to build community in those same ways to kind of like come back and to reclaim our relationship with Earth and with each other and our ability to um, shift that narrative. You know? And also just to say that two days ago the Biden administration had announced kind of like putting $150 million into kind of like that area because that freeway that was over Paradise Valley has, you know, been deteriorating and actually rebuilding that community, but but knowing this history of you know black people prior to that is deeply important because who gets to tell the story now? Mm -hmm. Whose buildings will be built right. in that area that's being revitalized? You know, but by having access to our stories and our past and how these things have happened allows us to kind of like collectively shape our resilience and our liberation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that. One of the things that really came to me when you were asking the question and thinking about it in relationship to the play, which I watched this morning on YouTube, I did not recognize that the monkey was reanimated, so I'm happy to hear that he comes back to life. Um, <laughs> was just thinking about how, like, without diminishing like the, the current effects of climate change um, that you're experiencing like firsthand, like acknowledging that like there's a global climate crisis. And that being able to tell these stories is it's a, it's a way of bringing you know awareness of the impacts of, of these challenges to to everyone. So here in Vermont, like maybe we're experiencing the effects a little bit less. Like this summer might be a different story since we had so much drought this summer. But last year there was so much water, there was so much rain, there was too much rain. And so you know, and like over the past few years or even decades. There have been people, including climate change deniers, who have been buying up acres and acres and acres of Vermont land because they know as the global climate shifts that Vermont will be one of the places that still has water. And so one of the things at SUSU that we've talked about in preparation for climate migration and welcoming people who are deeply impacted by the effects of climate change and will find themselves without resources and find themselves without water is that we can create space here for people to have like a to have a cultural easement to to have space for people who are impacted by climate migration to, to be here and to have a home here to call your home um, and so one of the things we've been talking about is how to create that that cultural climate migration easement to make sure that everyone has access to the resources that we still have um, and being able to utilize storytelling to help people understand why it's so important I think is really vital to the process. Steering away from climate change, uh, a similar question, um, just like asking, like, how do you think that like art, culture, um, like, like land access to it, has been affected specifically by the pandemic in like, recent times? It's only been a couple of years, but also how do you, how do you think it'll be affected? In Actually, it affected us more because most of what we do is 
mostly uh, an interaction which is one to one with the community when we go, we go out doing performances, uh, doing projects and all that. So when that happened, uh, the government was very quick to say, no more gatherings. Everything has to stop, everybody stays at home and all that. And then, um, because most of us were depending on art to feed our own families, we were caught, uh, we didn't know what to do. But we said uh, we, we have to act very fast. The first thing that we did was, how do we still continue doing what we're doing and, and still stick to the rules of what the government is saying? And then we, we came together and we said, um, can we still continue doing what we're doing, but in a pretty form? So because the COVID uh, thing was the current thing, we let go all the projects because even the projects that we were running at, at that particular time was stopped. We could not spend that money, which wasn't that much. So we went back to the guys who had given us money and said, we still have this little money. We cannot go to schools, we cannot go to the community. Can we use it to do the same, but on a big format? So we started doing a, a, a show which is called Dr. Pamoja. Pamoja in Swahili means together. So we came up with a character who's, who's called Dr. Pamoja and, and a, a monkey character who are now talking about the pandemic itself, how to wash hands, how, how not to come together and all that. Um, then immediately we started getting some little money that we can at least feed ourselves. And at the same time, we started disseminating the information now to the People. Actually, our focus was more on uh, social media because many people uh, in Kenya are having smartphones. That's the whole thing. And so it was easier for us. Um, we are glad that the, even the character out of the pandemic, which was bad, but it was good in disguise, that um, we were able to come up with a new show and able to do what we've been doing for. Yeah, um, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly surprised when she says that the uh, uh, farm is, is, is preparing to, to welcome people who are coming here and, and they might need to get some land and, and, and start a new life because in Kenya and I would even dare say in Africa, land is a very sensitive uh, topic, very sensitive in the sense that uh, People can actually even kill each other for land. Um, we, we've been there in Kenya, we've been there several times where if politicians um, who usually are usual, like they're the ones who instigate these kind of problems, come and, and, and then they, they divide us along the ethnic lines and they say, ah, this person cannot come and, and, and buy land here and, you know. So we've been there. And like Fidelis says, the pandemic has sort of like exacerbated this problem in a way that now more, uh, like people need that security. They, they, need, they, they feel that they, their only security is also to have, to have a place they can really go back to. Because a lot of people have moved to the cities, you know, for jobs, as always. But when the pandemic hit, and there were no jobs, or they were, like salaries were slashed into half, or, you know, like a lot of, uh, uh, um, income activities were were interrupted. They went back uh, uh, to the to the countryside, and and then they realized, oh, I really don't have anything. I don't have a house. Uh, I don't have land. You know, so that pressure is now mounting a lot of, on people to to uh, buy land or to acquire land, and then those kind of struggles can can uh, can ensue. So I think art can play or is playing a, a, a critical role in trying to uh, uh, to bring across a message that first and foremost that it doesn't have to be bloody, you know, acquiring land or, or living in a place where you don't. Because the thing in Kenya, I don't know whether it's the same here in the US, we, we do have like ancestral lands. Where I come from, it's Taita, which is like the coastal highlands, close to the Indian Ocean, but on the on the hills. It comes from the <coughs> part of Kenya. 
and it's difficult to, it's not, how can I say, it's, it's not like difficult, but it's a bit strange for me, from the coastal highlands, to go and, and, and buy land and leave where he comes from. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's sort of like, it's, uh, there will be some kind of friction. There will yes. be like, why, why is he here? What, what, what is, go back to your place, you know, that kind of thing. So art in this way can help people to understand, to, to accept each other. Like, you know, you look beyond your ethnic background, your prejudices, your, you know, your political affiliations and all that. And that's what puppetry can do. That's what we've been trying to do all these years, is to tell people, you know, first and foremost, we are all human beings, we are all Kenyans, you know, forget about your, your religious, political, economic, you know, uh, background and all that, and just accept and live with each other, you know. It's not easy, it's really not, I can assure you. It's very, very difficult, but somebody has to do the job. Like those two things you're speaking to a lot and just like the experience of land and of imagination being always the places where there is the most kind of like control at least from like a government place but also the spaces where we can access the most resilience and ability to transform and heal and like being able to I think like one of the things that we saw with the pandemic or anything like this is like the place where the the artists, the dreamers, the storytellers, the people who are able to dream beyond their current circumstances are really the people who are shaping the way of, of where we go and how we get there, mm -hmm. right? Because we have so many systems in place that work in a very specific way. They're very rigid and they don't leave much room for flexibility or something terrible to happen. And so when something terrible does happen, they fall apart and people don't know what to do because they have, you know, they have abandoned their imagination, their ability to create and dream beyond like what is currently into what is possible. And I think that... They've just been relying on the same thing for so long. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think that was a conversation can you speak up because you have the question? Can you speak up? Can you speak up? Don't bringing back in 
um, storytelling, bringing back in mentors and teachers and elders who can actually hold ceremonial space so that people can move through the grief and the trauma that comes up when we make these connections, because there is a lot here. There's a lot, um, particularly on this land and in this place, there's so much that's going to come up for everyone who tries to engage in these practices honestly. So we have to meet everyone where they are and provide the context and the container that can hold them through it. And only then can we really talk about healing together as a community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and, and do you have like, um, I don't know, like a, like a formula, or is it is it just like? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm honestly curious because um, people are different. You know, everybody comes with their, with, like you say, with their own experiences. So, uh, do you have like I don't know, like a like a guru or somebody who takes people through this process, or does it happen just by people discovering themselves when they're there and going through the process, or I don't know. <laughs> like, it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's definitely interesting. Yeah, so one of the things that we have been able to do this year is to invite some of our community's elders and mentors. So earlier in July, um, we have a Dagara elder who practices indigenous technology of, of West Africa, like in the area of Burkina Faso, and her name is Momoka Christopher. And she came and held a community grief ritual for, it was a multiracial space, so everyone was welcome to come and had her guidance as they moved through a ceremony that could help them um, connect with and transform their grief. And then just a week or two ago, we had Mexica culture bears from Mexico come um, and do several ceremonies throughout the week. And I think it's a little bit of a combination of like both of what you're saying, that we do look to elders, we do look to mentors, we do look to the, the wisdom that we both carry to kind of shape the container. We're definitely connecting with people in the community and finding out like what is needed and there are common themes like grief um, that come up all the time that we focus on. Um, and then it really is just holding spaces where people are able to express themselves, to voice what is coming up for them. Um, and try to meet those needs however we are able. But there's a lot of commonality, particularly here in this area. Yeah, and I think, I was just gonna say, I think there's also an aspect of like, a lot of what we do at SUSU is also being in relationship with the earth and with nature and recognizing like all the different ways that things happen in nature and that things don't have to be this like, we'll do X, Y, and Z and then you'll be healed and everything will be great. Like recognize, seeing healing as like, not not coming back into like joy and happiness and everything's wonderful, but like increasing our capacity to be with discomfort is really what we see healing as, increasing our capacity to kind of like hold discomfort and these sensations that come up so that we can move through a process through them without them overpowering us. And so everybody who comes into SUSU has a different life experience, you know? There's many commonalities, but through the process of just like creating space for community to explore like what does it mean to heal or to feel like you belong or to feel like your safety and your dignity and your belonging can all exist at one time without having to abandon any of those things. It's like, <coughs> it's like a very messy but organized in the way that nature is organized process where, you know, and then there's a lot of room for curiosity where things come up and then we can create what we need in that moment, like allowing for adaptation and change and all of these things to be part of that yeah, process. Yeah, just a question. Um, I think we, we had discussed this before the, the, the panel and, and I, I think uh, I just want to get it clear because um, you mentioned um, in, your, in your community that you came even guys from money. Uh, because uh, personally from where I come from uh, in, in our culture, we have very weird, sometimes weird practices. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to understand, are there rules that somebody is supposed to, to follow? Because um, there are some cultures in our country which they do rituals at night when everybody's sleeping. You say, don't do that when everybody's sleeping, you have to do your thing this time, or you just let everybody just do what they do. Well, a lot of times, at least right now, what has happened is we will, like, have an elder come 
so like this elder that Naomi's talking about, and then they will have kind of like they'll share like how the ceremony or like the space that they're holding works, and then we will kind of like yeah, and be a part of that space. But we have many different elders who come, and then we're kind of learning from them and and being present with their you know what is normal for their culture or their practices or for the prescriptions for the ceremonies that they're holding. So uh, is there any time limit for you to stay there or you just, when you come, you just be part of the community and you stay there? there. I want to come and stay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I would not They usually have a beginning, middle, and end uh -huh. at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is definitely... Which is the time you just told you, okay, now you can do it. <laughs> Sometimes there's an good. Yeah, you find that. <laughs> but, there's the, but there's the invitation to come back, right? So there'll be more offerings. It, it isn't just like the one time that it will happen. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll continue to invite elders who've already been here to come back. And Amber and I are in the process of receiving some of these teachings so that it will be more ongoing. So we'll be there and be able to hold and facilitate. Okay, I don't know if you have, y'all are already asking questions amongst yourselves. I don't know if you have any questions for them, but I do have one more question today, or like one or two, before I want to like give questions to the audience. Um, whether it's one or two will depend on how long it takes to answer. Um, but we've been talking about um, a lot about land. I want to transfer more into like, the art, the art side, and like especially like he with healing. Um, I this this question is like presented to all of you, but more specifically to Crystal. Um, I already asked you this question during our interview, um, but I find it pretty interesting. Um, I when I asked the question, I thought of like an example through of the game, through the games I've watched and played, where there are like four or five basic elements that kind of like set up the basis for the world and everyone's needs. Um, like meat is food, smoke is air. It, it's not exactly, it, it's, it's a surreal world. Um, but sugar is what keeps everyone like sane and within themselves without becoming the monsters that you face throughout the game. Um, and when having our interview, I found art to be, though not ex exactly like that, um, to, to be of like a similar essence, where it, where being able to express yourself in, I think being able to express yourself is just that that's kind of what art is. You can express. I'm trying to think of this in easier terms. Um, like expressing yourself in almost any way, like through your clothing or through paintings or through writing or through drawing, that's a that's an art form. Like every almost every kind of way you can express yourself is through an art form, and you need ways to express yourself. So, in our in our society, especially Western societies, we consider um, art making to be kind of unimportant, like a hobby or just like something you do in your pastime when in at least this, like in my opinion it's something that is really needed. Um, you need a way to express yourself. You need a way to like do something that will be able to like show how you feel about a certain topic, about how you feel about your life, about how you feel about maybe a certain person, like venting, <laughs> um, vent art. <laughs> um, how do you feel, how do you all feel about um, like people's view that art is like simply a hobby, hobby or a mild interest? Those people don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, in our lives, from the minute you're born, I think we are artists mm -hmm. in our culture because mm -hmm. everything is, is is art. We we have um, 
when your mother is bathing you, she's singing to you. Uh, when you grow up, you, are, you, you start getting your parents telling you stories. When you're going to the shamba, the shamba is the field, working on the, on the field, you have season where you sing certain songs. So uh, I think in our culture, we go through art from the first moment we are born mm -hmm. to express ourselves because we have songs to express every feeling. We have songs when people die, we have songs when there's happiness, we have songs to welcome people, we have songs even to welcome them to eat. You know? mm -hmm. So um, I think we've gone through that process from the day one. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um, but I must add that the, in as far as as this 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 is sort of like inbuilt in us. I think when we when we look when we come now to the corporate or the career aspect, people people then begin to change. Yeah, our parents and the society also begins to change. They look. If you say I want to be a singer, or I want to be an actor, or I want to be a, I don't know puppeteer. A puppeteer. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, exactly. They they then begin. Okay, uh huh. And what else are you going to be doing? Uh -huh. <laughs> so it changes immediately. Even though they they know that this is something that you're really passionate about, that you enjoy doing, and you know you're gifted in it, they would still not take it. I, th I think when we were like still in our in our youth, yeah, that I'm talking about now in the in the 90s, <laughs> it's changing. Thankfully now, it's changing slowly. It's still hard, but it's changing in a way because they are beginning to realize that there are some artists, some actors, some puppeteers who actually can make a living and are doing very well with it. So the attitudes are slowly changing, and there's a little bit of uh, acceptance because the. The art industry, not just in Kenya, but I think in Africa, is also rapidly growing. Mm -hmm. It's really growing very, very fast and adding into the, into the economy. So even uh, leaders are beginning to, to realize there's potential in it. Uh, and, and so they are, they are slowly by slowly investing in it, not as much as we would like. I mean, we obviously want more, but there is a little bit of you know, progress in that direction. So, Yes, there's still a hesitancy in some certain aspects of society, but I believe the attitudes are changing for the better. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have a story that uh, what, what Crispin is saying is as much as we, 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 are, we have that inbuilt, there was a time I, I used to work, I, I, I'm trained in, uh, in uh, pharmacy, so I was working in the pharmacy and uh, then this opportunity of uh, using art to educate people came to the place that I was working. So we were chosen four guys to go and train as puppeteers to continue doing the health education that, that, uh, that was brought from, from another organization. So when I started doing puppetry, it, because in, 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 in me I was an artist, so it was a very good thing. Was, ah, this is lovely, this is what I want to do, no. Mm -hmm. Then we started having festivals where we used to travel to, to the capital city. Then I took the first trip to go two weeks and then I took another one. Then the last trip, I was given an ultimatum. I was told by my boss, you either choose to be working or you continue doing what you are doing. <laughs> then I chose the latter, I, I, I took the trip, I went to Nairobi, I didn't tell my mother. <laughs> I hid that from her, and then when I came back, I pretended I was going to work still. <laughs> <laughs> and she wasn't happy. When she came to find out that, how can you leave a well-paid job and you going to do these things? <laughs> she didn't understand this. You know? So, um, many parents, don't take it as a serious mm -hmm. job. She passed away, but I wish she could see me.
I was thinking about it in terms of, of education. And then I, I think about how important STEM is and how STEM leaves out the arts. And my, my, my child, my son, who is nine, is homeschooled. And one of the reasons that he is homeschooled is, is because of the lack of arts education in curriculum. And so I do worry about um, what it means for American culture, in particular, because I can speak to that and know that a little bit better than other cultures, to not center the arts and to not create space. Um, like you're saying, arts are a way that we can express ourselves, but they're also a way that we can come together and create the like mural project that you were part of, things like that. Like art is a vital part of culture, and, and without it, we're, we're seriously lacking in one of the fundamental ways that we stay healthy and whole. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I hope that we can find ways to keep educating the public about how vital and important the arts are, because um, it doesn't feel like they are valued um, anymore. Yeah. Um, so it's like, we only have like, duh. 14 minutes left. So now I'd like to like present, um, bring the audience into into this. See if you have any questions. Go ahead. Hi. Um. Thank you. This is wonderful. So it uh, it feels like your practices are in person practices as you identified. And you also identified during the pandemic how you had to utilize other mediums, social media, in order to disseminate the things that you do, right? The, your stories, but it's also information and learning and teaching and growing and healing. And I'm curious, you know, with that experience moving forward, are you going to take any of that? You know, there, one of the things I think during the pandemic, which was really highlighted, at least here, is this idea of accessibility and, and what blocks us accessibility, <coughs> inequities in accessibility, and how social media can sometimes actually help with that or sometimes hinder. So I'm just curious how moving forward, um, a little bit of what you talked about, how that's going to potentially impact and how you feel about its impact and your ability to reach more people, but how you reach them. And is it as meaningful in your minds? Do you feel like it's as a meaningful in an engagement? Um, maybe, uh, I, I think it's um, it's uh, impactful. That I would say, and um, we didn't know that we, it could happen until we, when COVID hit, and we've seen um, a lot of feedback coming from the people who have seen the shows. I'll give an example. We had a, a lady who came to our puppet hub, and she came there because her kid was all the time asking her, she wants to see the character. Of, there's a character we call Bali, he's a small monkey, who works with the doctor, Dr. Pamoja. And that kid was demanding to come and see that, that <laughs> character. And the, 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 the mother had to find our contacts, call and she came. She said, this, my kid has fallen in love with this monkey. And the message that you, she's been insisting on washing hands all the time. <laughs> so that is one one incident, and there's so many that even our show when we perform after the show, we get people who say that information, that that story was so good. So as an artist, when you get one person coming to give you a feedback, that is a representation of so many of them who could not come. Mm -hmm. So that's how we see it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think as far as the pandemic is concerned, it's, it's very hard to tell um, the kind of, um, the kind of uh, lessons or the kind of um, uh, 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 takeaways that we can get, because it's still, it's still very much experimental. We, we still don't know the, the, the whole picture yet. So we can't we can, we can gauge and say, yeah, maybe going online and doing shows online uh, did have an impact because at least it kept us busy during that time. We were not just idle. But on the other hand, as somebody who is traditional, I, I, I must insist that theatre really is, is the meeting. It's the meeting between the, the actor and the, and the audience. So, and, and that doesn't really happen in front of a screen, unfortunately. Yeah. Otherwise, just watch Netflix or yeah, Disney. So it, it, it is still very much a grey area in as far as, yeah, we can now <coughs> 
we can now start to think of, of the future of puppetry in, in, in terms of you know, uh, 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 performing on YouTube or, or live streaming on Facebook and, and all that kind of um, mediums that are available. Mm -hmm. So it's, there is obviously a huge opportunity and a huge potential, but I, I'm not, I can't really say, yeah, this is some, something that we want to pursue and it could eventually be uh, 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 something that um, uh, is, is, uh, is working yeah, for, for, for uh, puppetry or any other form of, uh, except for maybe content creators who are just churning out every other day you know, for, for likes and, and, and comments and shares. So I, I don't know if, if you see it differently, but that's, that's how I see it. This question was just like random, popped into my head. Um, what about virtual reality puppetry? <laughs> just like thinking of like, because we're using a lot more like video and social media and such, so um, organizations like Zoom are like, we have to make, like, with, with the pandemic, and with people not meeting as much as they used to, people are going to, start making more stuff that would come closer to that <laughs> even though that, that's still obviously far down the line just what would you think about doing virtual reality mm -hmm. I, I'm all for technology I think it's it's definitely interesting but it's also a question of resource I mean if you if you're talking about virtual reality in a village in Africa that's not being realistic yeah. yeah. so if if we're looking at societies like maybe in Vermont and you want to try out the app, Absolutely, you can, you can try that and, and maybe it can work. And in a situation where you have restrictions, where people cannot go to the theater and you can still play and, and they can wear their devices and, and they're in the show. Why not? You know, that's, that's absolutely terrific. But in the context of, let's say, Africa and, and new technology is concerned, we are still, yeah. it's still growing, it's still young. And people need to first and foremost feed their families, take their kids to school before they can think, think of buying yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, so it, it, it will be some time before we get there. Yeah. I think also it feels like a, a both and, like I, I feel like I experienced some of what you were sharing too in terms of like, just like seeing the way that your puppet shows are where you're singing and there's vibration and there's like this connection that you can feel that through a screen, but it's not the same mm -hmm. as being there. Yeah, yeah, and being able to like be in that energy. And I feel like I know for myself, like my brain is able to like process or like really hear a story when I can be connected to it in that way that feels like it's only possible in real life or possible in a different way. And I feel like with Susu, where I mean, I deeply believe that you know, just like from our ancestry and like making a way of no way. And I think that like. There are many ways that black people have thrived through the pandemic because of our ability to shape shift and like use opportunities to create portals and use our imaginations and, and create beyond our current circumstances. And I think that that's powerful medicine. I think there's like many cool things that were able to happen by being able to do programming online. Like mm -hmm. you can snuggle up in bed and eat food while you're like <laughs> in a class. You don't have to be like, you know, in this environment, but I think there was aspects that are feel so sacred and important to, to building this kind of community and being in relationship with people and being able to, I mean, because we're doing classes where we're teaching ceremonies and we're doing ritual on Zoom, which is definitely very different for people to individually be in place and there's potent magic that comes from that. But I think that being able to hold both and of like, how do we use the resources we have when we need to and also how do we like preserve like these aspects of our culture of being together, being in community that are also so deeply important to our health and survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Social media was very important for the growth of Susu throughout the pandemic. It was how we reached our audience, it was how we connected, it was how we were able to sustain ourselves mm -hmm. when it felt like everyone else's doors were closing. Um, and we had powerful reach. We had students all the way up in Nunavut, which is like northeastern Canada and the Arctic. Um, we, I, I think when it comes to accessibility, it's very important as a person who experiences neurodivergence to be able to have other ways of being in community with one another. And so I think that we'll always have some 
aspect of that. But the, the other thing that became a, a reality in the past two years was Zoom fatigue. Just being in front of that community, community, computer screen for hours and hours on end trying to make these connections is so physically exhausting and draining. Um, that when we were finally able to be in person again, it just everything felt so easy and spacious. And so I think it's harnessing each for the things they do best. So being able to utilize the technology for what it's best for, and then being able to be in person when that makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. um, that feels what's right. Mm -hmm. um, are there any more questions? This isn't a question. I just want to say how happy I am to be all of you together talking to Thanks for being here. <laughs> I think it's, this is sort of an aligned um, comment, but in form of a question, which is that uh, you talked about um, the indigenous, the, the, the way in which the ceremony and ritual is still so much a part of your country, in Kenya, and in your culture, and, and made reference to the West, which you've also affirmed that, that we lack ritual we, we are we have we're longing for and seeking for um, rituals and renewal of rituals that that once actually did um, were a part of Western culture but have been sort of leaded away and I'm wondering if you might both talk about where there are other opportunities of cross-cultural um, exchange so that we can learn from one another some of the some of the opportunities for how, ritual and ceremony um, transform both communities and nations and regions? Uh, do you want to go first? Go. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe there are. I believe there are many opportunities and instances where we can both learn from one another. It's not just a one-way you know, traffic. Um, we have, like, let's say the Maasai people who uh, they still practice their initiation rites when you are when a man is entering into um, adulthood. Um, yeah, I, I don't know whether they still do this. You know, they, they still have to send the young man into the forest to go and kill a lion, yeah? and then you have to bring back home your trophy and say, "Yeah, now I'm a man." They say, "Okay, you can now get married." Obviously, I wouldn't advise you to do that here to go and kill a bear or something. <laughs> But it's just, it's just, it's just a, 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 a ritual to just encourage the young man to be more, more, uh, more courageous, to be more responsible, you know, because now you, you probably be responsible for a family. So it, it encourages the young man to, uh, to start thinking differently. That's the whole point. And uh, in, in, in the, I believe, I wouldn't speak for the Western, rituals or the Western practices, but one, one that I know of is more like when you're, an, uh, you're almost an adult, an adult then the, the parents usually, uh, uh, I don't know, they buy you a car or they tell you, you know, here is, is, is some money that we have been saving for you and so it's, it's if that's possible. Uh, they, they try to um, give you sort of like a like a platform, like a, like a foundation that can can help you begin your your life as a as a as an adult. So I believe there are instances. There are many many rituals, many many practices that the uh, Africans or Kenyans we still practice. Uh, I believe it's the same for for uh, Susu Farm and and you know. Uh, others might have that we can we can learn from one another. We can say, okay, this is something that could work for me, and you know, this is something that uh, cannot work. And why not? You know, uh, exchange uh, and grow from them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I appreciate what you're saying. Also, kind of like in comparing those two rites of passage, because I think in the West, often we also aren't able to notice the rituals that we have that seem really mundane, but when we can be in relationship with those, like uh, like sweeping the floor or mopping or like, you know, like the way that we can bring ceremony and ritual into, like we call that at Susu, we call it radically regular. 
right? Like it's like all the stuff that we're doing is really just basic, but when we're able to actually remember and acknowledge these rituals that we do have, like what is here and that we can really like feel into those practices because it's really kind of like the ability to, to be with what is and to enjoy these really mundane and basic things that are ritual. And like, I think we romanticize like these gigantic fancy ceremonies with all of this like beautiful stuff and like feel like we're lacking because we don't have them. But there are so many ways that we have access to ritual and ritual is crucial to our health and our development. Um, I would also want to point out something because um, we've been having a problem with this, that um, trying to relate the Western culture with the, with the African, it has really brought a lot of problems in many, many uh, communities and houses at the same time because we have um, a kind of a different um, um, look at things where we, 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 we say a man cannot like wash dishes, you know. And these are things that we, we are really, really struggling to, you know, to try and, and make them, you know, fit into what the modern life because now it's we are we're actually moving from where we, we are as a as a as a, a culture and moving towards a different different uh, place where it's not more that like we have to stick to our culture. We've been having problems where uh, you hear um, a man like, I'll tell Crispin, how can you wash dishes? You're a man, you know? This is not our culture. Patriarchal. Yeah. So we, we've been having that struggle whereby we're still fighting to be, to, to align the Western with, the, with our culture, but it is taking uh, very little, uh, you know, steps. Rather than, you know, it will take time. I think it yeah. will take time. And some things, I'm pretty sure they will still stick to where they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to add on, it's a question of, of taking what is useful because I think times have changed. You know, and, and some people are still stuck in the in the really old ways. For example, female genital mutilation. This is still. It's still practiced, unfortunately, in some communities, even though it's clear that it does not help anyone. It's just, it's just hurtful, it's, it's wrong, it's, a, it's just wrong, it's a violation, and it doesn't work. But because they like, ah, no, 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 my grandmother practiced this, and, and she left it to me, so I have to do it to my daughter, and you know, so there are some, some of these, uh, I think I've shared also with some of you, uh, another one which was just like, um, which really wasn't the HIV pandemic at the time, was that in, in some communities, if I'm married and uh, I die, then my brother was to inherit my wife. So I could have died with HIV AIDS. And in some cases that was the case, but it was, it was forced. There was no negotiations. You cannot, you cannot deny, you would just have automatically, you get the wife and the family, and you have to continue uh, uh, procreating with this wife. So, so some rituals or some practices uh, or could have worked maybe back then for some reasons because we needed to I don't know, fill the earth or we needed to, I don't know, there was some, some context that, that were at that time relevant and now they just don't work. So I think it's a question of taking what really works yeah. and, and, and you know, sharing what doesn't work anymore. Or given, or, or given the, the old things, the context. Yes. You know, for example, yes, I don't want to say inherit your wife, but take care of her. Yes. yes. You know, the, 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 just renaming yeah. the context yeah. makes the ritual preserve yeah. itself. And it happens, way. it happens because it's just natural. Because if you have a, your brother's family and, and your brother is, is, has passed on, then you automatically want to take care of him. You, 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 but that aspect of no, you need to now start sleeping with her. Does it have to necessarily be there? Sorry, one last question, and then that, that, it's past one now. So. Oh, I, have <laughs> one. I can ask it offline. Uh, <laughs> uh, so then, like, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's the 
it's, it's about time. It's 105. The panel should be like ending now. I'm pass it to Shoshana to properly wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> I can go. On. moment and say goodbye to those of you that are joining us online to say thank you. But before we do that, I just want to do a little pitch for SUSU in this community because this is a fairly new um, organization here and has just grown and, and resourced and it's so exciting what you are doing. So for anyone who lives here, they're currently looking for volunteers to drive around CSA packets, so please speak to them. They just got their own land, which we're so excited Woo! about. Um, and I think you're always looking for volunteer support and, and financial donations, so please um, talk to these two wonderful people uh, if you can, or look them up online, send a little donation, and uh, just help them survive and thrive and grow in this community. And then likewise, please follow Crystal Puppeteers online they have a lot of virtual content that you can experience, as they were talking about, over the created um, very much over the pandemic. So you can engage a lot uh, as you continue on, even though we have to say goodbye And today. they have a show tomorrow at 5. They do. For those that are here in the community, please come out. It will be the final show of the festival uh, in Putney, behind the Putney Inn. And we'll be very excited to see you all there. 5 o'clock. Thank you.